take it off. Go ahead. Now. Yes, sir. <laughs> Acts chapter 16. If you guys can, turn your Bibles here. Open your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible right in front underneath the um, chair in front of you or one of the chairs. Please uh, grab a Bible there. Um, title of our uh, message, The Pervasive Gospel. The pervasive gospel, guys, and as we continue studying in Acts 16, you guys remember last week we were studying um, the beginning of Acts 16, and we saw um, Paul and Timothy, and Timothy, um, Paul brings Timothy along to go on on the uh, mission field with him, and we talked about uh, moms and grandmothers, right, and encouraged the moms and grandmothers um, just in this journey just to disciple um, our little boys and our little girls, and then we uh, went on and we saw that the church was encouraged, the church was built. Up. And then we saw um, at, at, towards the end of that um, text there, guys, where the Holy Spirit um, told them not to speak and then forbade them to go into a certain region and to put the brakes on and pause. And then we saw that Paul had this vision at night, right? And he saw what? This Macedonian man saying what? Come over here and help us. And so we saw that and we walked through that. And so now we're going to go into this region of Macedonia and then they move on, guys, and we're going to see where the gospel is going to go through into Europe. The first woman, again, women, for whatever reason, as I was reading through this again, I was seeing um, all the women that were, um, we're going to see even in this text, we're going to see the lady of purple, right? Lydia, right? Who is going to, um, we're going to see, I won't give it away, we'll see it in the text, right? Then we're going to see this woman that is possessed, right? And Paul is going to be agitated in his spirit and he's going to speak not to the woman, but he's going to speak to the spirit. There's a lesson in here for us to learn in that as well, ladies and gentlemen. And so um, this demon is going to be, um, be cast out, right? And then we're going to see Paul and Silas are going to be in jail, right? And as they're in jail, they're going to pray and they're going to praise the Lord. And then we're going to see salvation break forth. And we're going to see that in this text. And then you're going to see these men, the, the magistrates, the leaders of the city, right? The leaders of this city, they're going to come and they're going to try to secretly send Paul and them out. And Paul is going to say, no, 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 no. We're not doing this in secret. You want to come and beat us in front of everybody, right? And ridicule and persecute. Us. And so what we're going to do with that is you're going to come and you're going to lead us out so that the people see this and we're going to see this whole uh, message take place. But what we're going to see in this, guys, this pervasive gospel. The gospel pervades things, guys. I um, have this definition of pervasive. Um, put that up on the slide, please. An unwelcomed influence or physical effect spreading widely throughout an area or a group of people. And we're going to see that here in Acts chapter 16. It's pervasive, ladies and gentlemen. When we allow the gospel to do what the gospel is designed to do, guys, it pervades, it goes places where it is unwanted, where it's unwelcome. But God is the one that is on the throne. Amen? Anything right. to add, Garrett? Yep, I'm ready to read. All right, let's rock and roll. From Troas, we put out to sea, verse 11, and sailed straight. For now, I, I had trouble with this word. I had to look it up. It's it's Samethres. The next day to ne uh, Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. Now, Macedonia was named after uh, Philip of Mace of Macedon, and also Macedonia was named that. But also Philippi was named that. Interestingly enough, in Philippi. They spend more time, Luke gives more ground to where they are in Philippi than anywhere else. Of course, out of that, when Paul writes back, he writes what? The book of Philippians to the people, in, to this church, to these people we're going to see right here. Paul is going to write a book, one of my favorite books in all the Bible. It's the book of Philippians, okay? So, verse 13, on the Sabbath day, as Paul always did, right? He went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. Now, he didn't go into the synagogue here because it takes at least 10 Jewish men to set up a synagogue. So there weren't 10 Jewish men, obviously, in the in the city. Otherwise, they would have a synagogue there. So Paul goes down to where they did the ritual cleansing and where he could go to any city. And if there were any Jews whatsoever, they would be down by the river 
praying and seeking the God. And interesting, I thought about this this morning when I was reading through it again. I wonder if because of these women that were praying and asking to see more of God, to experience more of God, and to have more of God, that God answered the prayer by giving Paul the Macedonian call. I was like, wow, I wonder if that, these people are, these ladies are praying, they're seeking God, and God sends Paul the apostle. Possible, right? Mm, I mean, mm, that's good. Yeah, answer to their prayers. So uh, uh, they fi- they expected to find a place for prayer. In verse fourteen, a God fearing fearing woman, maybe this woman's prayers, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. Interesting. We have a rich woman here, a woman of influence. We're going to see in a minute a poor slave girl, and then after that, we're going to see a middle class. Garter of the gate of the prison, the, the, the warden of the prison. So God does not a respecter of persons. Mm. He doesn't care whether you're rich or poor. He doesn't care whether you're middle class. He does not care if you're a drunkard or a rich man. He has come with a pervasive gospel to save souls. And I love this story because these three people, you have a rich, you have middle class, and you have a poor slave girl. Anyways... Um, where was I? The Lord, oh, here, this one, this is a good one. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. What was he saying? Mm. Jesus died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He ascended on high. It's a gospel. Mm. Right here, God, notice who opened her, who opened her heart? Say it, say it out loud. The Lord. Who? God opened her heart. God opened her heart. We'll get to uh, a little bit more of that in a minute. Hey, you guys, we got to wake up this morning. <laughs> uh, Can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things. I, I barely get a, a smile out of the Calvinist in the front row over here. but No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> one of the things, um, a lesson I learned in that little statement there, guys, is that the Lord opened her art. Uh, one of the things, um, guys, that oftentimes we try to open up people's heart. We try to play the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that we, um, as a people, need to trust is we need to trust the Lord to do the work. Our duty and our responsibility, just show up, deliver the word. Think about this. One of the things um, here, this word, uh, where's this word at? The word, oh, to put out into the sea um, in verse 11 has this meaning to lead up. To lead or bring into a higher place. I was looking at that. Then, check this out, Luke, of navigators, right? Launch out, set sail, or put out to the sea. So one of the things, Are guys, the navigators for us, awake in the back row? <laughs> one, of the, one of the things for us, ladies and gentlemen, what we just need to do, we just need to show up. Launch out. When the Lord speaks, just deliver the word and trust the Lord, Lane, to what? To open that individual's heart or that individual's mind. Go ahead, Gary. Okay, so in verse 15, and I want you to underline this, circle it, whatever, because we're going to see the same thing in the Philippian jailer's life too. After she and her what? Household. Household were baptized. She urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. So here we have hospitality, and she persuades them to come and stay at her house. Interesting. But her whole household was baptized. When God comes into a family, when God comes into a life, when God especially comes into the man of the family's life, what we see are miracles. We see God work. We see God begin to pick off family members. And it took years for my family, but everybody, my siblings and my parents, got picked off by the Lord. Amen. Right? God opened up their heart. Why? To the gospel. And, they were, and we were all baptized. So, um, do, you wanna, do you wanna read 16 or you want me to keep going? You got it. All right. Verse 16. As we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit. Now, Interesting, check this out. You know what that spirit in the Greek is pneuma pythona. How many of you guys love snakes? Mm. Right? Uh, Okay, the word that they're using there, the python was a mystical serpent or dragon that guarded the temple and oracle of Apollo. So we think, uh, here's here's the reality of it. Spirits have names. 
Spirits have dominion. Spirits have areas. Don't believe me? Look at Daniel. In Daniel, there was the prince of Persia that was holding off a bunch of angels from getting to Daniel as he prayed and fasted for three weeks. The angel, Gabriel, could not get through. So he picks up his cell phone. He gives a call to Michael the archangel. Michael the archangel comes down, beats everybody's butt, sends them back, to, back where they belong. And the angel, the Gabriel, was able to get the message, prophecy, of what was going to happen in the future, all kinds of, I mean, go back and read that. It is absolutely amazing. So here we have this Numa Pythona snake, a slithering spirit that has possessed this little girl, the slave girl, and she is able to be a sorcerer or a fortune teller or a palm reader, if you will, in our modern term, or an, uh, um, uh, astrologist, astrologer, no. yeah, Stro- uh, 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 reading the stars. Whatever she was doing, it was demonic. It was evil. It was wicked, and this spirit has possessed her. But here's the cool part, right? Here she goes, and and notice this, right? As they followed Paul, and and she cried out, these men who were uh, proclaiming to her to them, the, these men, excuse me. These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are servants of the Most High God. Now, you would think, so what? That's, that's a good thing, right? But if you notice, Jesus never let the demons tell who he was either. He always yeah. shut them up right away. Now, I don't have the application for that. I don't have the why or the reason for that. I haven't, uh, James and I were at a conference all week, so I, I hadn't really... Hey, I'm just being honest, had a chance to really dive in and find out why Jesus never let the Spirit speak of who he was or why Paul doesn't let the Spirit speak of who he is here, but he shuts, he shuts up the Spirit really quick. He says in verse 18, she did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. <laughs> Turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her right away how did he get the spirit out people all right we're gonna take a t- coffee break time out everybody go get a cup of coffee come back we'll wait 10 minutes no i'm just kidding come on how do you get the spirit out jesus's name jesus's name do you realize that you have power and authority over d- the demonic but not you christ in you because you are washed by the blood, because you, you're, you're the son of the most high God. Remember when, um, we're, we'll get to it, but remember when um, uh, the, the, the seven sons of Sceva go to try to cast out this demon out of this crazy de- demonic man, and what, is, what do they say? They, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. And then what do the demons say? They said, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who the heck are you? And this deep, the, the naked demo, the, the, the dude beats these guys so bad, tears all their clothes off, and sends these seven sons of Sceva running down the street. Now, Paul could have walked in there. You could have walked in there. I could have walked in there and said, I cast you out in the name of Jesus. And I've cast demons out of people before. And I've seen God do powerful things. Matter of fact, when we were up in Idaho, I was praying for this 16-year-old girl. Her uh, father, her stepfather was a Satanist, and he used to dip uh, washcloths in blood and put it over her face and then rape her at five years old and say, Satan is entering you at this very moment. And she was demon-possessed. She had had a, just a demonic childhood. And we set this girl down, and we were praying for her, and there were four of us. And I was on her left arm. I had her left arm like this, and I'm praying for her. And she just convulses, and she freaks out. And I grab both hands on her left arm. And with her left arm, she picked my knee. I was on my knee. She picked me up off the ground. And then I began to cast the demons out of this girl, and I, I began to ask the demons their name, and they had all these different names that we, we were trying to remember and write down, and, and she didn't know me from Adam, and she started cussing at me, I am going to blankety-blank kill you, Garrett Grobner, and your whole family. Hmm. I'm going to murder them all. And this girl didn't know me from Adam. She didn't even, I don't even know how she knew my name. Anyways, make a long story short, she's the secretary of the church up there now. Hmm. God is more powerful than you think. The demonic world is real. 
And in America, we ignore it. You go to India, you go to Mexico, you go to the Dominican Republic, where people believe in, spir- in the spiritual realm, where they believe in Pneuma Pythona and all kinds of demonic forces. You will see spiritual stuff going on like you've never seen it before. But here, we do not have to be afraid. We have the power. And the power is the name of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I got on a little roll there. <laughs> that story just came to my mind. So, so I good. A right. so. couple of things to <laughs> highlight um, in this text as well, um, because there's a, we, it transitions um, to this demon-possessed woman from Lydia, um, the seller of purple. And what we see in the story and the, the, the storyline of um, Lydia is that they were praying. You transition here, what do we see? Right in verse um, 16, and it's important to note, once we were on our way to where? Prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the weapons that we have been blessed with, ladies and gentlemen, that we do not utilize. And I just want to encourage us that we will be people of prayer because we're going to see over and over again in this text, ladies and gentlemen, as prayer, prayer, there's something that takes place as a result of prayer. Secondly is this. This is vitally important. As I was reading through this text, I was mindful of the city. And you see this over and over again. I think it's five times in the first couple of verses, you see city, 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 mindset, right? So what you see here is that the Bible says that that as, as Paul turns and looks, turning to her, who does he speak to? Who does he speak to? The spirit, not the woman, not the girl. That's important to note because I think that we miss out or we lose out, guys, because we believe that the, um, the battle is against what? Flesh and blood. But the Bible says, no, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against what? Spirits and principalities and powers. So in that, when, when we're dealing with people, whether it's the city, whether it's in this building or wherever we are, ladies and gentlemen, the key is to understand the battle. The battle is in the spirit realm, and I'm not speaking to that individual but I'm going to turn and I'm going to cast out what that spirit that's leading that individual it's the same thing with Colorado Springs and the Bible says that the whole world is under the sway of the devil and I think we we personally don't take the spiritual realm seriously enough I think we we have all kinds of other ways that we deal with things This person is this, this person is that, this person has this, this person has that. But I'd be shocked, or all of us would be shocked to see that most of it is a spiritual dynamic that is happening in their life, that Satan is after them. He wants to sift them like wheat. I mean, my wife and I, this morning, we got up at five o'clock this morning to pray. We sit down on the couch. The dogs haven't moved. They haven't moved an inch. All of a sudden, the dogs are jumping all over us. And we've been there for a while. And we've been trying to pray. And then Mercy, who never wakes up that early, as we're praying, by 5.15, she was up and she was talking to us. I mean, the demonic does not want us on our knees praying. And when we tried to pray this morning, I I mean, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but it was one after the next, after the next, after the next distraction at a time where usually my house is not stirring or moving. But when we got down on our knees, immediately the whole house is stirring. What's up with that? I know what's up with it. Hold on. Here we go. Hey, this word, (laughs) check this out. The Bible says that Paul was annoyed Annoyed, right? You look at this word, so annoyed. So was I this morning, now that you mentioned that. I Say was pretty again? stinking annoyed. <laughs> I'm sure he was. You it has this a, meaning a um, to be troubled or displeased or offended or pained or to be worked up. So, um, there are things that get us worked up. There are things that uh, we dislike or displeased about, whether it's in our households, whether it's in our communities, whether it's in our families, guys, whether it's in our city, our state, our country, whatever the case may be, we get worked up. But what's, what's leading that? Well, Paul told us is what? Spirit of what? Divination. So the key is to what? To look and speak to what? That spirit that's leading that mayor, that's leading that governor, that's leading my, hey, whoever that individual is, is that spirit. Make sense? 
All right, verse 19. When our owners realize, I, I just I do want you to notice though, the gospel is preached, somebody gets saved, what happens? We looked at this a few weeks ago. Satan attacks immediately. Mm. Immediately, Satan attacks. He doesn't want the gospel shared. Mm. His whole goal is to make sure that he takes as many people to hell with him as he possibly can. Now, verse 19, when her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our cities. They are Jews and are promoting customs and uh, that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack. Satan's still at work here against them. And the chief magistrate stripped them of their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks, verse 25, okay? Here's, here's what's gonna happen. You cannot stop the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Every time you preach the gospel, every time you share your testimony or a testimony of what God has done in your life, every time you share the, 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 the virgin birth, the, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, his death, his atoning death on the cross, his, his burial, his resurrection, and the glorification of him to heaven at the right hand of the Father, every time you share that, the power of God is unleashed. It is a promise in the word. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Oh, 100% I want to say so, yes. <laughs> so before you go to verse 25, a couple of things here, guys, I, I think that are, is important. Um, verse 19, when her owners realized. So there's always someone or something behind what's really going on. You guys with me on that? Very important to take note. The owner. So in their mind, they own this slave girl, right? And then when they found out that their profit was no longer going to continue to grow, all right, they have some problems. But then you also see in this text, guys, you see the owners are, con who the owners are connected with. And how is it that they have the authority to bring them to, to, to the what? The magistrates. That's important to take note. So some things that I'm learning, ladies and gentlemen, even going to this conference I went to, I'm thinking one of the things I had shared with Gary, my wife, and Bethany, sometimes I think too small. Sometimes I think too small. And what I got to do is open my mind and my heart and allow the spirit to lead and guide me to think from this to where? Here. Because there's something going on behind the scenes. And this is the key thing. The spirit is what reveals those things, ladies and gentlemen. But you and I have to be in tune to the spirit. So keep in mind the owners. The other thing I want to point out here, guys, is this. He says here, um, verse 21. Let's just read verse 20 and 21. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously doing what? Disturbing our city. Mm. They are Jews and are promoting, think of this term, customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. All they bring in is what? The gospel. You have a, a woman that, is, it, that has a demon leading her. And what he does is cast the demon out. And what these men are saying, what they're really about, remember, the Bible says what? The love of money is the root of all what? Evil. What these men are driven by? Money. Their profit is going to be what? Taken, right? And so they're like, no, 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 no. These customs and these things that they bring in, it's unlawful. Now, I have a verse for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, real quick, because they don't understand what's really taking place. We got that verse on the side. But as it is written, what? I has not seen... Ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? Love him. But he has revealed them to us who have what? The spirit, right? Then the next, last part, what, what is this? Um, next next um, slide, please. But the natural man, these men can't understand because they're in the natural man, does not receive what? The things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are what? They are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is rightly judged by no one. 
So these men, they can't understand what's going on. Why? Because they don't have a spirit. And so they come in here, and as they are casting out this demon, they say, these are not the customs, and it's not legal for them to do it. It's not about customs. It's not about legal, uh, legalism either, guys. What is it about? It's about the gospel. Go ahead, Garrett. So in verse 25, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were cussing God out. They were so mad at him that they actually put him in prison, and they were beaten. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> they were suffering severely from BHPM syndrome, boo hoo poor me syndrome, feeling sorry for themselves, wanting to get even with the magistrate, figuring it out a way. I mean, it doesn't say that. They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. They were celebrating. They were praising God in their circumstance. Man, how many of you have failed miserably in that one? Raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> right? But we're to praise in all circumstances. And interestingly enough, turmoil, difficulty, persecution, hardship are not indicators of being out of God's will. Just because you're going through a trial, just because you're going through a situation, just because you're, your, your world has been turned upside down doesn't mean that you're not in God's will. It's a fact. We're called to suffer with him. Paul and, and Silas are praising the Lord for their circumstance. God, what do you want to teach me in this? God, who are you going to save in this? Why am I in this situation? Why am I in this circumstance? Why am I right here, right now, in this time, in this place, and what, what does God do? By the way, you remember Moses. He brings the Israelites after the ten plagues. They cross through. They, they get up to the Red Sea. They have the mountain range. Okay, God told them to go there. God told Moses to go right there by the Red Sea. Camp right here. He told them specifically. They had the desert to their right. They had the mountain range to their left, and they had the Red Sea straight in front of them, and they had the world's most powerful army coming down upon them with every soldier in Egypt, the greatest power of the world at that time. They were boxed in, and God told them to be there. But what does God do? God said, Moses, what are you doing just chilling? Why are you just sitting there? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Raise your staff. The sea, we know the story. The sea parted. Moses and the people of Israel go through on dry land. The world's greatest army follows them in. And what happens? Moses puts down his staff. Boom. They're all destroyed. But they were in the will of God. They didn't see the way out. Same with Jesus in the boat. Let's get in. Let's go to the other side. The storm hits. They're all panicking. Everybody's fearful. Everybody's lacking faith. We're in this trial. We're in this tribulation. We're, we're freaking out. Jesus is snoring. What do they say? Don't you care that we're perishing? Hmm. Don't you care? Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? He stands up. You have little faith. Peace be still. Sometimes we're in the midst of a trial. Sometimes we're in our prisons. Sometimes we feel like we're being beaten and flogged. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself. Since he thought the prisoners had escaped, but Paul called out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself because... We are all here. And can you see the jailer runs around the corner and looks at Paul and Silas and Paul and Silas have these big grins on their face. I mean, think about it. We're here. Relax. And what does he say? The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, you have to do penance. You have to work for a few years. You have to say 3,000 Hail Marys. No, <laughs> that's not what Paul says. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. How are you saved? Is there any, is, is it rocket science? 
How are you saved? We obey him because he loved us first and now we love him. We do works now by faith because of what he has done for us on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not rocket science. The gospel, salvation, Christianity is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then hang on for your life. Because he's going to blow your socks off hmm. if you follow him. That's, that's the gospel, guys. But I got one more thing to say, and then I'll turn it over to you, because this is important. Good. Rock it's all important. <laughs> you and your household, hmm. verse 31. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, the gospel, along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds right away. He and his family were baptized. He brought them into the house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. When the man comes to Jesus Christ, something supernatural happens. Noah, his whole household. Jairus and his whole household. Cornelius and his whole household. There is something significant when a man in a household comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do a study on it. Starting with Abraham. Starting with Noah. And then Abraham. And watch what God does in a family when the man decides to follow Jesus. Anyway. Got anything to that before we move on? Yes, sir. And just in that section, uh, I think it's important. Some things I wrote down, you can write down in your notes. Persecution leads to prayer. Prayer leads to praise. Even in your prison, and then salvation comes forth. Hmm. i say it again. Persecution leads to pray prayer. Prayer leads to praise. Even in your prison... But what comes forth? Salvation. So it's important to note, guys, that in those times of us being persecuted, God has given us something beautiful for us to walk in, ladies and gentlemen. And even when it's painful and when, it's, when it hurts, things aren't going our way, guys. Even in that persecution, get on your knees and pray. Direct communication with God in order to accomplish his will here on earth. Prayer, direct communication with God in order to accomplish his will here on earth. And what is his will for you and I? Sanctification, holiness. And sometimes that is not, that doesn't feel good, but we see it in here, ladies and gentlemen. The other thing I wrote down here, um, the foundations of the prison, the Bible says, was what? Shaken. All the doors were open to the prison by God. And everyone's chains were loosed. It's important to take heed to that. That's the gospel. So when we talk about pervasive gospel, ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is pervading the city, it's pervading families, it's per, excuse me, it's pervading individuals, it's pervading families, it's pervading the community, it's pervading the, the, entire, um, the entire city. Ladies and gentlemen, so it's important to take heed. Let the gospel do what the gospel does. What? The other thing, hold on real quick. The other thing, suicide. When I moved into this city, one of the things that was stated over the several years is suicide was a major thing throughout Colorado Springs. Well, we see here, suicide, this man is about to do what? Commit suicide. Because he knows that, man, these people have been freed, so I'm going to get in trouble. But what does Paul say? Paul says, do not harm yourself. We are here. Church, that's you and I. Mm, that's good. That's you and I. Is there someone... Actually, this morning, I woke up, and I'm getting dressed, and I'm, one of my neighbors, they're just going at it. And my spirit was a little annoyed. So I went downstairs, opened my garage, and walked out my garage, and I just engaged in a conversation with the man. And I just started ministering to him. And one of the things I think about sometimes with this individual, I wonder sometimes that if, if this man is going to commit suicide. Because he hates some of the things that he walks through. So when the spirit leads me, I just go and I just speak. Ladies and gentlemen, no different from you. 
Are there people in your life that's at that brink of just ending it all? And what you need to do is, just like Paul says, hey, don't harm yourself. Here I am. Read 32, verse 32, because that just goes right with what you're saying. And they what? They spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. Let's trust the word. You got a word there, go. What you got on that? No, that, that I just, you said, you know, you mm. went and spoke the word to this mm -hmm. guy, you know? I mean, that's the, that's the reality. The word is what changes us. The word never comes back void. The word is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Proclaim the word. Hide the word of God in your heart so you can share it with somebody on the plane. Hide the word of God in your heart so you can share it with your neighbor. Hide the word of God in your heart so you don't sin against him. Hide the word of God in your heart. I know a guy right now that will give you $25,000 if you memorize, whatever version you memorize, the book of John. There's a challenge for you guys. Oh, I'm going to memorize that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, 25 grand. He'll hmm. hand you 25 grand That's if good. you would go from the beginning to the end in the book of John. Hmm. Can't miss a word, though. That's the bummer. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Say, can I do it in the Greek? <laughs> <laughs> Love that's shorter. tough. Anyway, let's keep reading because we're about yes, out of sir. time. Um, when daylight came, the chief magistrate sent the police to say, uh-oh, here comes the cops. <laughs> Release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul. The magistrate have sent orders for you to be released. So come out now and go in peace. Yeah, go in peace. I mean, the, the jailer had to work on their wounds. So, I mean, they're pretty beat up, I would imagine. Probably thir uh, t 39 stripes minus one or beaten with rods or, you know what Paul says in his little thing, uh, in his in his thing in uh, chapter 11. But Paul of Corinthians, Paul said to them, they beat us in public without a trial, although we are Roman citizens and threw us in jail. And now we are going to send us and now you're going to send us away secretly. Certainly, no way, dude. Certainly not. <laughs> On the contrary, let them come and face us themselves and escort us out. The police reported these words to the magistrate. They were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And you know Paul's just messing with them, having a good time, right? It's okay to have fun. So they came to appease them, and escorting them from prison, they urged them to leave town. And here's verse 40. Here's a little nugget for us all. After leaving the jail, they didn't leave immediately. They didn't take off. Mm. Um, after leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house, where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and then departed. Now, when Paul wrote the book of Philippians to this church, he was in a prison in Rome and I have seen that prison and it's a hole in the ground and they would lower your food down in a bucket and they would raise your potty in the same bucket. Eesh. It was a nightmare. And Paul says... So many times in that book, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. The joy of the Lord in their hearts. Man, I struggle with that when I go through trials and tribulation. To have joy in every circumstance. I'm human. I confess in front of you all. This last year and a half, been hard. Many times, Things came out of my mouth that weren't praise, even on the phone, to the insurance company, to the bank that just kept 70000 of my dollars and say that I'm not going to get it for six months when it's my money, the insurance check. I almost lost my salvation over that one, if you could lose it, which you can't, so there. <clears throat> my wife says, Garrett, you just need to praise. You just need to praise. Not always easy. Rejoice again. Again, I say rejoice. Mm. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Be anxious for nothing but with prayer and supplication. And thanksgiving. We always leave that out. Make your request known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Whatever's true, whatever's pure, 
whatever's noble, whatever's good report, whatever's praiseworthy, meditate on those things. And the peace of God will be with you. And then in verse 11 he says, I've learned in all things, whether I'm abased or abound, to be content in all things. Verse 13 of chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have to remind myself of that. Because as I put that verse up earlier, he's never let me down. Sometimes it seems like I'm being let down, but he always picks me up, gets me out, sets my feet upon the rock, which is Christ Jesus, and allows me to continue on. Allows me to repent, ask his forgiveness. And washes me clean, fills me with his Holy Spirit. I'm able to pick up my cross, deny myself, and follow him again. These three lives in this, touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ, weren't the only ones. It was whole households. That means slave girls. Lydia's probably had servants. Cornelius, his whole household. Servants, sergeants. Some privates that were in his household. He was a centurion. The gospel was pervasive. And if we walk and we live it and share it, he gets the glory. We just get, get to enjoy him and partake in him as we walk with him. Amen? Got anything to add to that or you want to pray? I'm um, just closing to wrap it all up. Remember, even the wealthy need the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, those of royalty and needed the gospel. I caught eyes with this gentleman um, on Friday morning. It was just one of those moments where I just, I didn't follow up. Typically, when I catch eyes with somebody like that, have a conversation with them. Cut eyes and have a conversation with him. Um, and you might know who this gentleman was. Well, who was he? He was a politician. And he stood on the, he sat on the stage and he confessed. He said, you know what? Sometimes people forget that we are in need of encouragement, in need of being reminded of the gospel. And so it just spoke to me that James Gordon, don't forget, it's not about you. When my spirit leads you, it's your responsibility. Same thing for everyone sitting in this congregation. When the spirit leads you, it's your responsibility to go speak to that individual regardless of what you think about them. So you see a woman, as Garrett has shared, a woman of wealth. That's how the gospel permeated where? Europe. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, even those in prayer, and we see prayer was a key component there because as Gary shared, these ladies are sitting there praying, and how do we know that that it's not through their prayers that ushered Paul in with this Macedonian call, so prayer is vital. Next section, again, prayer with a what? A possessed woman. But what do we speak to? Do we speak to the possessed woman, or do we speak to what? That spirit. Numa Pythona. My wife hates snakes. She probably loves the, that a demon is named the, the python. <laughs> <laughs> and then don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, in persecution, persecution turns into what? Prayer. Prayer leads to what? Praise. The prison doors open. Salvation. And those who are walking around looking to commit suicide, maybe they're calling out to you saying, you know what? Help. Help. What you need to say is, here I am. And then what do you deliver to them? Just deliver the gospel. Let the gospel do what it does. It delivers people. It preach brings salvation. Preach the gospel to yourself every day too. We need to preach it to ourselves. Lastly, very important to take note. Be mindful of secrets. Because they tried to send them out how? Secretly. Be mindful. Your secrets? Oh, okay, Lord, give me insight. Give me wisdom. Speak to me. 
Lord, show me really what's going on behind the closed doors. When somebody's trying to send you out secretly, be mindful. The gospel is powerful, ladies and gentlemen. What I want to encourage us to do is let's be dependent upon the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is the one that opens those doors so that you can see behind those walls really what's going on. The goodness of God. Sit, Garrett. One more, one more thing. I promise. One more thing. <laughs> In verse 15 oh, I forgot that one. and verse 40, we see a woman that has the supernatural spiritual gift of hospitality. Hmm. Always opening up her door, blessing people. Amen? That's good. Shall we stand? Shall we pray? Josh, you want to bring the boys up and the girls? Go ahead and pray, James. Yes, I do. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that we get to live life with you, being led by you. God, thank you that, as Gary shared, Lord, you're not a respecter of man. No matter the scope, whether a businesswoman to a possessed woman, to a prison guard, your gospel, Lord, permeates all of that. And we're, we're grateful. Help us as your people, Lord, to be people led by your spirit. Fully trusting the good news. Believing in the good news. Putting our trust and our confidence in the good news. That brings salvation. That causes earthquakes to where the very foundation is shaken and shattered. To where people are saved and sanctified. Lord, help us as your people to continue to live this life on mission. Your mission. And may we not be a people that are ashamed of your gospel. Knowing that it is what? The power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then to the Greeks, Lord, to us as Gentiles. So, God, thank you. Thank you for your word. We just want to tell you we love you. More importantly, God, as I always pray, thank you for loving us first. Bless the rest of our time, please. We love you. We honor and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you can come forward and uh, receive um, this morning um, for communion and uh, come back and lead us in a time together of communion, okay?